what I'd like to do uh, during this first part is to really talk about the number of unanswered questions and uh, raise them as uh, remaining issues that need to be understood more on the research side as we progress gene therapy, AAV gene therapy, uh, further through the clinic. Uh, my disclosures, I, I'm on the board for WFH, but I also consult for a no number of hemophilia and non-hemophilia uh, gene therapy uh, companies. So our goal, I think we're all aware of, is to move from the left of this uh, slide over toward the right. Uh, so rather than get repeated peaks and troughs, uh, which we see with conventional factor, which we see with extended half-life factor, uh, we, as we move into non-factor therapy, we have started to lose those peaks and troughs and we get to a constant level of uh, factor, uh, of non-factor, factor-like um, uh, coagulation activity. And then for gene therapy, we get to more of an, what one might call a prophylactic state with a constant, a constant amount uh, that could potentially be considered a cure depending upon how we define cure. Uh, we still don't know how long this will last. Uh, uh, so there's a number of new players that have come along. I'll talk about a few of these trials, but uh, we'll only briefly refer to other ones. I'll use a few to illustrate uh, some of the points. Our goal is simple. I think we've all heard enough about that this week. We need to get a functional factor eight or factor nine gene uh, into, uh, in this case, in most cases, the liver of individuals with either hemophilia A or B. We've had to identify a delivery vehicle for the gene, uh, and by default, that has emerged as AAV, um, as I'll describe in a little more detail in just a moment. But the criteria really include delivering the gene so that we have a high transduction efficiency, that we can get the, the protein produced out of the cells so that we can target it more toward uh, the cells that we're interested in having make the protein. We need to deal with the serial prevalence rate uh, and identify ways to uh, minimize that as we deliver the gene. Uh, and then other practical considerations uh, as companies decide how to develop a drug include to have uh, to the need for blocking intellectual property and or freedom to operate to develop their drug without infringing on others. So the question about AAV comes down to what can get a gene from the outside of the cell to the inside of a cell. Uh, and many, many uh, techniques have been tried. Uh, variety of virus vectors, uh, variety of polymers, um, and even physical methods. Physical methods don't really work when it comes to in vivo, uh, in vivo uh, delivery of the gene. And non-viral vectors really have not worked either, uh, despite um, uh, quite a long history of trying to uh, remove ourselves from the, the disadvantages of viruses and work with something that might be less toxic. Uh, so that does leave us with AAV. This is a uh, cartoon of what the AAV looks like and eventually what the drug looks like. Uh, so we're dealing with a promoter. Most groups have developed liver-specific promoters using um, the strong promoters from one or more of the uh, proteins that the liver makes. And so that includes uh, everything from albumin to um, thyroglobulin uh, binding protein, um, uh, and uh, in many cases, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, and so these are, all, these are all promoters that can deliver, um, deliver good activity for the transgene of interest, which in this case is factor eight or factor nine. Um, to make the AAV, whether it's in a uh, eukaryotic cell or in some cases in an insect cell, we need to add back the two AAV uh, genes that are responsible for some replication as well as the generation of the capsid of the AAV. And then all of that comes together in a cell line in culture uh, to produce the intact virion that contains the, uh, the construct uh, capable of making the gene. Something happened to this slide as, uh, as we loaded, and I couldn't figure out how to fix it, but it's a combination of two slides, but maybe we could work with it. So the, the schematic here is that we need to get the, 
the viral vector, the AAV, delivered intravenously into the, into, the, uh, into the cell. Most of the AAV does a first pass through the liver, and so that's why an, an abundant amount of uh, gene product is produced in the liver um, within the hepatocytes. Uh, and between the time that the virus enters the cell and the time protein comes out, a number of discrete steps need to take place, which are only incompletely understood. Some of those are shown actually in this other slide that's in the upper left-hand corner. Um, these AAV particles, uh, vectors, bind to specific receptors on the cell surface. Most of the, by and large, these receptors are growth factor receptors, such as the PDGF receptor or one of the FGF receptors. Uh, and so they do double duty, and uh, viruses have actually figured out how to hijack those receptors in order to enter into our cells over a long period of millions of years. Uh, and so then once into the cell, uh, s normal cellular processes take over. That includes endocytosis, wrapping it up into a, a uh, small vesicle. Uh, and within the endosome, uh, that generally targets, uh, targets proteins to different places. In this case, this is going to deliver the capsid uh, to a degradation pathway, and it's going to deliver the DNA construct into the nucleus by ways which are really not well understood um, at all. Um, once in the nucleus, there's a number of forms of DNA. There's the single-stranded DNA that's coming directly from the virus, uh, the vector, um, and that needs to become double-stranded DNA, and so that can occur either with positive and negative strands coming together, because that's what's delivered into the cell, or it can come from new DNA synthesis to make a double-stranded DNA. That's a relatively unstable form. Um, it's not clear how long it lasts. It may be weeks, uh, but eventually it will be degraded unless it becomes episomal and closes in on itself uh, to form a stable DNA-resistant um, uh, piece of genetic uh, information that remains outside of the chromosome. A small amount of it does integrate uh, into the chromosomes. Uh, it's a relatively small amount um, relative to the total amount of virus that's delivered, uh, but nonetheless, um, it, uh, it is present. Uh, as the capsid then goes uh, into its degradation, peptides are formed. Those peptides uh, get presented in the context of the MHC class one. Uh, and they can be presented on the surface of the hepatocyte and respond, uh, cause the response of an anti-capsid CD8 cytotoxic T cell that, uh, if sufficient numbers are made, will destroy uh, the, uh, the um, virally transduced cell. And that's exactly what happens in a viral infection. Uh, so no difference there. Uh, the only difference is that we don't want that to happen here, and we do want it to happen in a viral infection. This covers some of that in, in uh, the same amount of detail, so I think I can skip this. But uh, bottom line is that these particles can get into the cell um, and then get shuttled into different compartments, um, and we still need to deal then with the capsid uh, that, needs to, um, that needs to be fully degraded. Uh, and so we understood this through a series of experiments that occurred um, between the initial experiment that was done between uh, CHOP and Avigen uh, uh, back in the early 2000s. And I'm showing one patient here that was the most revealing patient. Uh, this is where AAV2 delivered the factor IX gene, the native factor IX gene. Uh, and within about two weeks, this patient made uh, about 12% factor IX. And then as you can see from the curve, he lost it in the subsequent several weeks. Concomitantly, the ALT rose, and this was our first indication that we were dealing with some type of a toxic insult to the hepatocyte. Uh, and then after years of investigation, it was determined that it was that cytotoxic T cell response that I just described on the previous slide. In work done by Amit Nathwani and our own chair, where did our chair go? <laughs> there he is. Um, Ted Tuttenham, uh, they uh, were able to determine how to control that cytotoxic response uh, simply by administering prednisone when the ALT went up. Uh, and so that was a, um, 
um, simple yet very innovative uh, way of thinking about it, to think about it in terms of autoimmune hepatitis and what would one do there. You'd give a bolus of steroids. And so what you can see in two of the participants from the University College London St. Jude trial uh, is that um, both participants had rises in ALT. In the one case, the top case, the ALT rose to around 200. In the other case, it didn't even get above normal but concomitantly, the factor IX dropped. And so by administering prednisone, one was able to preserve factor IX activity without losing it as, was, uh, as it happened in the first study. So this really enabled uh, the development of the proof of principle uh, that was uh, published in 2011 and again in 2014 to show the long-term preservation of factor IX activity. Uh, and so this cytotoxic T cell response uh, is something that has been difficult to reproduce in animals, um, but yet it's been seen in humans in a number of clinical trials. The interesting thing about it is that it's probably not the only story as to what's happening to the hepatocytes. And so we'll cover that um, in a little while too. Um, and that was the slide that popped up onto the earlier one for some reason. So what are all the causes, possible causes, of this transient liver enzyme uh, um, elevation and presumably liver inflammation, although we've been unable to confirm that with the biopsy. And as I mentioned, we have not been able to demonstrate this convincingly in animal models. So the first choice is the cytotoxic T cell response. I think that's a given. It's been shown in several studies, and it's been validated with L-spot analyses that demonstrate uh, interferon gamma production um, and uh, uh, the hallmark of a cytotoxic T cell response. It's also been shown uh, that some of the capsids that are from the viral capsid itself, some of those peptides can actually bind to individual patients, class 1 uh, HLA, uh, that also confirms then that that could appear on the membrane of the hepatocyte and cause, uh, cause the cytotoxic T cell response. So I think everyone's pretty well convinced that that is at least one major mechanism that um, has been seen independently. Um, with at least two different serotypes of a uh, of vector, uh, AAV8 and AAV2. Um, it has not been seen, however, with AAV5. Work from both Unicure and Biomarin haven't, haven't really been able to detect the cytotoxic T cell response. So it raises the question of what else could be going on. And uh, the short answer is I don't think anybody's clear. Um, the hypotheses, though, are fairly limited as to what else could be going on. A tremendous amount of virus is being delivered, and so that means that the cell has to process the capsid, uh, which um, is, uh, is a large load on perhaps a small number of cells that get transduced within the liver. Uh, and so that may overwhelm the cell degradation, the lysosomal machinery to um, uh, be able to accomplish that and uh, induce some level of autophagy. Uh, in addition, the transgene protein synthesis load, we're, making, we're asking the cell to make a complicated protein in the case of factor VIII, uh, but even with factor IX, it's a protein that requires a lot of post-translational modification. And so uh, there may be ER stress and unfolded protein response. We know that factor VIII can induce that uh, based upon work back to 2008 that Randy Kaufman and his colleagues had done. Uh, and that factor VIII is, is actually unique, uh, in, relatively unique, in being able to do that. It's a difficult protein for cells to make. So I think that these are two areas of further investigation that are required. And then more recently, a month or two ago, some acute inflammation was seen that uh, in animal models, in two different types of animal models, um, by one group, um, a few days after transduction, so within a few days of actually uh, transducing uh, the, the animal. Uh, and that has not been seen before with AAV, so it's an unclear etiology and whether it's a function of this particular preparation of vector or if there's something else that we need to be aware of. I think we just all need to um, make sure that we monitor for that. But certainly in all the clinical trials, the patients are closely monitored and this has not been seen. There's a lot of different serotypes, as I think you're all aware. Most of these are derived from human or non-human primate, and an awful lot of effort has gone into trying to validate tissue tropism. This serotype binds to this tissue or that tissue. 
Um, and for the most part, it's not been particularly productive and actually has been quite misleading uh, because whatever people have found in the mouse may or may not occur in the human, often does not. Um, and so the, pre the predictions from the mouse have um, pushed certain vectors toward human clinical trials when other vectors may have done just as well or better. So most individuals, most groups are now using non-human primates to really validate the serotype uh, specificity for particular types of tissues for whatever they're interested in. Um, the AAV, uh, where did it come from? It's been around for a very long time. It made its way into mammals um, if one looks phylogenetically, somewhere between 25 and 47 million years ago. And in that, um, in that context, it then gave rise to a whole variety of other serotypes throughout mammalian species. Um, we came into this as a field 30, 40 years ago, really through identification of these AAVs in mammalian species, uh, AAV1, AAV2, and so on, um, and primarily in primates. Uh, and so in the primates, a whole series of AAVs that are listed on top uh, have been identified. Uh, and then a series of other AAVs have been identified in other animals. And this, I'm sure, is just the tip of the iceberg. There are, uh, I'm, I'm sure, hundreds, maybe even thousands of other AAVs out there that haven't been discovered. Remember, AAV doesn't cause any disease in humans, and so by virtue of that, it's difficult to find them. If you, if you don't have some signal to look for them. Um, the interesting thing here is that AAV5, although it was identified in a human, um, is actually very closely related to goat and is really a goat AAV. Uh, and so in that, uh, in that sense, uh, it's a demonstration that you could look for AAVs in non-primate species, and if you can identify one that can infect a human cell, then that's a potential uh, AAV that could be turned into a vector. That's accidentally what happened with AAV5, but it would be of use to look in other AAVs um, as, uh, as a means of uh, decreasing the serial prevalence, since these are farther removed in their amino acid homology from these primate AAVs that are demonstrated above. Uh, and so that's a strategy some groups have pursued as well. So speaking of seroprevalence, uh, there have been dozens of papers looking at seroprevalence in small populations uh, and have found um, a series of mixed results looking at um, a variety of different uh, largely primate AAVs uh, because they're all using different reagents, they're all using different types of ELISA methodologies, uh, and so it's not clear at all what the overall seroprevalence is. What what we can conclude is that for most of these different serotypes, it's somewhere around 50%, uh, plus or minus. Um, in most studies, AAV5 turns out to be a lower seroprevalence. It has about a 64% homology to the other primate AAVs, since it's not a primate AAV. And the primate AAVs all have about 84 plus percent homology to one another. So that accounts for the increased cross-reactivity among uh, those species, but also uh, AAV5 is only 64%, it's 64% homologous, so there's plenty of cross-reactivity even with AAV5. Uh, so the problem we have is that if we get farther and farther away, then we're going to not really have um, vectors that are capable of infecting human cells. There have been a number of solutions proposed. None have really made it quite to the mainstream. There have been some modification of serotypes, some genetic engineering to decrease antibody recognition. Uh, for instance, the AAV8 that Spark is using um, is about 92% homologous to AAV8, and as such, it's decreased by about 10% the seroprevalence, and so that's a step in the right direction. Um, others have tried to develop decoy vectors to soak up the antibodies prior to giving uh, the, um, uh, the vector containing the transgene. Uh, and as I mentioned, looking at other mammalian uh, cells, uh, sorry, mammalian viruses. So things really changed, as we've been hearing this week, um, over these last couple of years, and these two papers were published um, in December of 2017 in the New England Journal, one describing uh, clinically, me clinically meaningful gene transfer um, 
for factor IX and the other clinically meaning tra gene transfer for factor VIII. Uh, and uh, our own VP of medical, Marika Vandenberg, uh, wrote the editorial that was associated with one of those. And so I'll go through some of the factor IX trials. There's a whole series of them. The top one here I talked about is where the first evidence of a cytotoxic T cell response to the vector capsid was discovered uh, in that single patient. Uh, and then the next one down is the um, Nathwani, uh, Tuddenham, uh, uh, St. Jude, uh, UC London uh, trial. Uh, where they got stable expression of low levels of factor IX and were able to demonstrate um, de uh, significantly decreased uh, factor utilization and uh, decreased bleeding rates. Uh, another trial uh, that was run with uh, factor IX used a mutant that I'm going to describe in a couple of slides, and um, that trial uh, didn't really work well and unclear exactly what happened there. Um, and then a trial that I'll describe in more detail, the SPARC trial, uh, where at one year they got 16 to 81 percent activity in, in about 10 different patients. Uh, and now there are a series of other trials that are ongoing. I'll talk briefly about the Unicure trial, AMT060, uh, and how it's turning into 061 uh, using the uh, um, R338 uh, transgene. Whoops. Uh, and an additional trial um, where the transgene is put into the albumin gene, and so in a form of gene editing uh, to provide safe harbor for it, uh, is uh, open. The trial's open, and um, uh, I don't know yet if they've recruited patients. So this looks in a little bit more detail at the um, Nathwani et al. trial. I showed you two of the patients that required prednisone therapy because of elevated transaminases. This is all 10 of the patients. And what I wanted to show is that um, these patients uh, got long-term sustained uh, low-level factor IX uh, secretion. Uh, from the hepatocytes, and several of them had spikes in the transaminases. They were able to control them with prednisone, and although they lost activity, they were able to stabilize the activity um, in most cases uh, to a, um, uh, a steady state of factor IX production. Uh, this Unicure trial started off using the native factor IX transgene, and I, I believe it was essentially identical to the UCL uh, St. Jude uh, construct. Uh, and they went, uh, they developed two cohorts, a low dose and a high dose. Their low dose cohort averaged over, um, over two years about 4.8% factor IX activity, and the high dose about 7% uh, factor IX activity, so consistent with a dose response. Um, and what uh, they did find uh, elevated uh, transaminases in a couple of their patients. They treated with steroids, uh, but um, they really did not find evidence of a cytotoxic T cell response. They uh, um, b believe that the activity was not sufficient, uh, especially given what, um, what Spark was doing with the uh, with the Padua mutant, and so they developed a plan to switch to a high specific activity uh, factor nine. Uh, so what about the Padua mutant? Uh, well, this is, uh, it has its basis um, in uh, intersecting ways that validate its, its use. In 1998, Daryl Stafford and his colleagues at UNC Chapel Hill d um, identified through a series of random mutations of the factor nine uh, uh, gene, a mutation at R338 that uh, had threefold increase in specific activity. This was proven to be um, important when um, an Italian group, Simonini and Ruta, now at CHOP, uh, found that there was a natural variant in two brothers that had a five to tenfold increase in specific activity. And that's listed in the table here from their New England Journal paper that was published in 2009. So these two brothers, one brother had clinical problems with increased thrombosis, the other one did not, and they both had an eightfold increase in specific activity of the factor IX. Uh, and so that seems like a really good idea to use for gene therapy when we keep trying to push the limits of how much vector can be delivered and how much transgene can, uh, can be expressed. Uh, and so what um, 
uh, what Unicure decided to do was to do a two nucleotide switch and convert the native factor IX into the Padua mutant. Uh, it's now known as AMT061. Uh, and do a little comparability analyses uh, that uh, would validate that uh, that the safety and efficacy are what one would expect uh, and move that toward a phase three study. So uh, it's, um, it's nice to see the regulatory agencies be flexible um, on this. I think we're going to need much more flexibility as we go forward with gene therapy. And as long as we see comparability, it would make sense to, um, to be able to do something like this. Um, what precipitated all this really was the data that came from the SPARC trial where they had started off using R338L uh, and were able to demonstrate, as you saw uh, yesterday uh, from the presentations, uh, good sustained activity over a period of at least two years. Uh, it ranged from about 14 to 77 percent over this period of time. They did see two transaminase elevations. Uh, gave three patients uh, steroids um, and did find evidence of this anti-capsid uh, cytotoxic T-cell response consistent with what they had seen before. Uh, safety was good uh, and they had a profound reduction in bleeding rate and factor utilization over these two years. Uh, so a very successful innovative study. If we move on to factor eight, uh, there are several groups that are pursuing Factor VIII. Uh, the one that has generated uh, uh, complete Phase one 2 data is the AAV5 Factor VIII from, uh, from BioMarin, where at the first year they demonstrated about 100% uh, Factor VIII activity. There are several other Factor VIII trials that are ongoing now that are variations on a theme using different constructs, uh, different promoters, um, and uh, different, uh, different serotypes. And so it will be of use to be able to compare and contrast to see um, what emerges as most successful here. The shaded area is the normal range for factor VIII, 50 to 150 percent, or inter, um, I use per deciliter. Uh, and as you can see, by about week 16 or 20, um, the um, uh, factor VIII activity comes up and remains, uh, remains within that normal range over a period of uh, up to two years. Um, we can see that we peaked. Uh, we peaked fairly early uh, and then have uh, it settled down. And one of the unclear questions there is what forms of, of DNA is, are present in the nucleus, uh, as I described earlier on the cartoon. Uh, and how stable are each of those forms before they become episomes, uh, which do offer increased stability. Uh, they uh, used a lower dose of um, uh, AAV5 factor VIII and demonstrated levels that approached the normal range or just got into the normal range for some of those patients at one year. Uh, so two different doses and evidence of a dose response. So between both of these trials, the SPARC and the BioMarin trials, I think what we can see is that there have been substantial reductions in bleeding, substantial reductions in factor use, uh, and the trials have set the stage for phase three studies, which are now ongoing with BioMarin are, and uh, are in process between uh, SPARC and Pfizer, where Pfizer will take take over responsibility for the phase three studies. So how much factor correction is enough? Well, uh, that's an open question and uh, one that does not have an answer. Based upon this famous graph uh, that we've seen in many venues now, uh, one would assume that at least 12 to 15 percent, which would eliminate uh, essentially all joint bleeding, would be sufficient. 3% would not be sufficient, and I think the question we're left with is whether or not normal levels of factor VIII or factor IX should be the goal. There's a framework for looking at this, what's known, what's unknown, um, and if one applies gene therapy and puts it into this kind of a framework, we can identify at least what we do know, we can identify what we know we don't know, uh, and uh, we can even identify what we forgot we know. Um, which, which happens frequently uh, in clinical trials. Surprise, uh, surprise adverse event that um, in retrospect maybe shouldn't have been a surprise. Uh, so that's a common, common thing to happen. Um, if we think about those known unknowns, it's a long list. 
And it's part of what we need to do in research to support these clinical trials, because although the answers to all of these aren't needed before licensure, we should be working toward this because they can help us to develop improved therapies, um, next generation therapies, and avoid any mishaps along the way as well. So how much integration do we get? That's not at all clear, um, although it's more than zero. Uh, how do we best manage this mild hepatocyte toxicity? Is prednisone the most effective way? Uh, where else in the body is the vector going? Um, why do we see so much variability in protein production? Is it a function of the host? Is it a function of the vector getting into the cells? Um, how do we circumvent the pre-existing immunity? A number of ideas have come up, but I think um, we should be spending time on that rather than excluding half the population from gene therapy. Uh, and the duration, how long will it last? We know from animals that it will last um, uh, essentially for the life of the animal, but we don't know, we don't know in humans. And then there's a whole series of other questions that uh, go on here, including whether or not uh, children can be given the gene therapy and at what point it would no longer be effective because the liver is so rapidly growing. Um, what about primary endpoints? We've been advocating that the factor level ought to be the primary endpoint. The EMA has tended to agree. The FDA up till today has not. Uh, and I'll cover that in a moment. And so there's a lot of rationale for the primary endpoint um, being a clotting assay and a chromogenic assay. We do see some discrepancies. Uh, just as we have for the extended half-life products, uh, and those really are not well understood, but above a certain level, even if these two assays are a little discrepant, um, I'm not sure that that matters. They're still reflecting the replacement of a defective gene uh, and the activity of that replacement. Annualized bleeding rate um, is compounded by false positives and false negatives, and while it can give some reasonable approximation, of uh, the effectiveness of a gene therapy, for instance, uh, it still is an unreliable endpoint as well. Uh, and no one is suggesting that it's one or the other, um, but which one might be a primary and which one would be a secondary. Who's eligible for the gene therapy? The inclusion criteria are pretty restricted at this point, um, and I think that that will loosen up as, uh, as we gain more experience and people uh, are more comfortable with both the safety, efficacy, as well as the durability of the gene. So what about the future? I'm going to quote our relatively new uh, FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, and on the left is from something that he uh, said a few months back. Uh, I believe gene therapy will eventually become a mainstay in treating and maybe curing many of our most devastating and intractable illnesses. And then I believe just yesterday uh, he made an announcement that uh, he wants to focus on gene therapy and figure out how to move it through the agency much, much faster. And so he actually said, um, in contrast to everything the FDA has said up to this point, that long-term effectiveness or even traditional measurements, such as a demonstration of a reduction in bleeding rates in hemophilia, could come in post-market follow-ups. So uh, it sounds like the FDA is moving, uh, and we'll need to wait for a little more detailed information to see how that applies directly to these phase three, uh, phase three clinical trials. But I found, uh, I found this not only refreshing, but encouraging as well. Lest we forget about the developing world, I need to remind ourselves that we do need to focus on how to get, uh, how to get this eventually into the developing world once it's been proven effective in these clinical trials. Uh, because they're not, they're not benefiting from any of the technological advances over the past 100 years. So with that, I will stop. And um, I'm not sure, do we take questions now? Or have I overstayed my welcome?